Welcome to Mine Unveiled. We continue with our Tartaria Explained series, where we attempt to put together the different pieces. We know many who follow us will be familiar with these concepts, but there are still many who refuse to look into the subject because a proper presentation is yet to be made. This is our attempt to achieve that goal. We hope to inspire curiosity into those of you who may be beginners into this subject. This is going to be our new style. I think it's kind of interesting, you know? We want to keep our egos removed from the channel, but with the avatars, we can be more expressive in our presentations as we speak. Also, while we might have these digital 3D bodies now, we're most definitely not artificial intelligence of any kind. Right? We get the funniest comments sometimes. There are people that think we're computer-generated voices based on machine learning. You'd think we'd make fewer errors if you were robots. <laughs> Anyways, let's begin. Let's start off with a quick recap. So my first video was on Tartaria and the Irish, and that got removed by YouTube. And it's okay because it's all up on the website now at mindofveil.com, but to be honest, I'm not really sure why I got removed. They were really vague, but I think it's because I mentioned some names, so this time, I'm only going to be referencing groups in a historical sense. Plus, warning, the following material may be sensitive to your perception of reality. Please do not watch if you're easily offended. The first video on Tartaria was about the connection between the ancient Irish and Tartaria. The second video was on the Phoenicians, but it's very vague and mostly centered around the Mormons. Now we can continue to something that we're definitely not taught in schools, and that is that the Phoenicians had settled in the American continents far before Columbus. We are taught that California was founded by the Spanish in 1542, and yet if we read what Cabrillo wrote about the islands of California, he states, Yet, wild and desolate as they now are, Gabrijo says that in the 15th century they were densely peopled by a superior race, and that the mainland was dotted by villages. The children of the islanders are described by early navigators as being white with light hair and ruddy cheeks, and the women as having fine forms, beautiful eyes, and modest demeanor. The whole story of California as we know it is not taught accurately in schools. It's funny. Disney actually had an attraction called Golden Dream starring Whoopi Goldberg as Queen Calafia. I wish I could show it here, but you can still find it on YouTube showing the short film. It starts with Calafia guiding you through a journey of the history of California. They're telling you truth mixed with lies. She says she's the spirit of California, and one of the first things that I thought was weird is that she says that when the Spanish landed, they landed on shaky territory, implying that there was a great earthquake. They missed a big part of the story though. Who is Queen Calafia and where did this name come from? It comes from a Spanish romance fantasy novel named The Adventures of Esplandian that was published before California was found. Here's what mainstream history says. The Adventures of Esplandian is the fifth book in a series of Spanish chivalric romance novels by Garcia Rodriguez de Montavo, which began with Amadis de Gaula, an even older series. Las Sergas mentions a fictional island named California inhabited only by women and ruled by Queen Calafia. When Spanish explorers learned of an island, actually a peninsula, off western Mexico rumored to be ruled by Amazon women, they named it California. From BigThink.com When a mutineer from Hernan Cortez expedition into Mexico in 1533 discovered the peninsula that today is known as Baja California, Followed by a visit to the southern tip of the peninsula by Cortes himself, the Spanish conquistadors thought they had stumbled upon the legendary California described in Montavo's novel, not quite comprehending that the literary creation was entirely fictional. Okay, well why would Cortes believe in the story? It's because it's based on truth. Give me time and I will break this step by step, but there are many pieces to the puzzle. I have to lay out many factors before I can make this very clear. From Wikipedia, quote, the island of California is one of the most famous cartographic errors in history. It was propagated on many maps during the 17th and 18th centuries, despite contradictory evidence from various explorers. Okay, well, I'm calling BS. There's a cover-up happening. First off, what are all these islands on the shore? You're telling me these are mistakes too? They could have easily found out this information. Look at all the colonies that they supposedly have set up. Why did the Spanish leave? Disney insists that it has something to do with earthquakes. Well, there's more than the idea that California is just an island. That's just the start. There is no error. Argument 1. There's multiple maps from various cartographers that are supposedly based on even older maps. Argument 2. 
The story of the adventures of Esplandian is based and connected to the same story told by Plato and Critias, where he talks about a great war between Atlantis and the great Terra Firma. We're about to look at some books by the author Girolamo Benzoni, one of the first writers on the history of the New World. In many of his writings, it's very clear that the Spanish reference this land as Terra Firma. So, if mainstream history is true and that California got its name because the Spanish thought the novels were based on truth, then it further adds to the arguments that they believed it to be based on truth because they referenced the mainland as Terra Firma, showing that there is more to the novel than just mere fantasy. Argument 3 The great continent situated west of the Atlantic has been referenced and written about by classical writers such as Critia, Plato Solon, Silene, Theopompo, Aristotle, Cicero, Strabon, Eratosthenes, Macrobe, Mela, Silax, Alienus, Pline, Stadius Sibosus, Posidonius, Festus Avianus, Diodorus de Sicily, Plutarch and Cilia, Senec, and many more. Among these names, there are those whose works are missing or fragmented. This shows that many writers knew about America far before Columbus. Therefore, they knew that this land was not a myth, and neither were the stories of California. If we take a look at some of the first writings on the New World, we will find some interesting information. We're going to take a look at some of the engravings by Bry Theodore. These show America much different than we're brought up imagining. The schools teach that Native Americans or the Indians were the natives of this land. I have some information that will contrast that narrative. In the book by Girolamo Benzoni, America Par Quarta, we see very strange people living in Florida when the Spanish arrive. White pale cannibalistic giants where the males are balding and the females have blonde and red hair and they definitely do not look like what we know as Native Americans. There's so much I want to say at once but I have to take this slowly if we're going to make sense of this. If you look deeper, you find that they say this is just a coloring error, and they try to cover this up in more recent versions by coloring everything this weird color. It doesn't add up. The truth is, there are many instances of red hair giants occupying the Americas, a race descendant of the snake. These people are the Phoenicians, and I'll show you. In the book, The Phoenicians in Haiti, he shows how it's completely possible that the ancient Hebrews could have traveled to America. This also goes with the Book of Mormon and the Levites. Here is a Bry engraving of a Native American. Here is an engraving also by the Bry of the Picts. When looking at the engravings of the Celts and the Native Americans, I got the same impression from some of the leaders. It's very similar. The Phoenicians, or the ancient Hebrews, who descended from the Hyberborean or Iberon, Iberia, Ireland, are completely capable of having been known of America slash terra firma. There's a lot of evidence for this. The best example is that this is in the Book of Mormon. Joseph Smith finds gold tablets left by the Levites. Okay, come on. If you read the story, it becomes apparent that there was a great civilization in America far before Columbus. This is the reason the Spanish avoided certain areas. They knew all about California. You may be wondering, well, what happened? Why are they described as primitive or as savages? Not too long ago, the sun disappeared. You can find this in many Native American histories where their people had emerged from a cave. Why were they living in a cave? Now, this is some controversial information, but it's based on the book History of the American Indian by James Adair. The whole purpose of this book is to attempt to prove that the Native Americans are descendants of the ancient Jews. I'm not saying that's true or that I believe it, I'm just going over what I found. The author brings to light many tradition-based similarities between the two cultures. This is another source that goes along with the Book of Mormon, and if it's true that the Phoenicians were great builders of modern Victorian type architecture like it says in the Bible, then could it be that there was a great nation in the great west of America, even the Grand Canyon, but something happened, a great catastrophe, and the people were forced to go underground. It's likely that this event shaped and distorted their features, as they were incapable of seeing light for up to 25 years in some legends. Imagine what this would do to your consciousness. This explains so much, and there is even more to cover that is far from the mainstream narrative. In 1909, an explorer named G.E. Kincaid came across a cave that held mummies, copper ornaments, hieroglyphs, and more impossible artifacts. This is often dismissed as a hoax because no one has ever rediscovered this cave. However, when you realize that the government has quarantined specific areas of the Grand Canyon, it becomes apparent why no one has rediscovered this cave. Not only that, but the first settlers of the Grand Canyon gave Egyptian names to the different formations of the Grand Canyon. Why is this? The story of Amadis of Gaul is basically a long drawn out fantasy romance novel 
with their typical motifs, but I found it interesting that the characters in the story represent different things. Esplandian is the son of Amadis, or Spain is the son of Great Britain, but in the story, this is when it was Gallia. Ireland and Spain used to be connected at one time in ancient legends, making one giant island known as Ibernia. The story is of a time before the Great Cataclysm, or Reset. I'm sure that many of you have heard of the Vikings coming to America. Well, let's just suppose that the story of Tara in Irish lore is true, or the stories from Plato where Solon tells of a great war between Atlantis and the great terra firma. Just throwing this out there, what if the Spanish went to America before the reset and were well aware of California and Mexico? At this time before Spain was Spain, hence the symbolism of Esplandian and his adventures. Bernal Diaz says, we were seized with admiration and declared they seemed like the castles of enchantment recorded in the book of Amadis de Gaula, grand towers, temples, and edifices that seemed to rise from the water, and all these were constructed of stone and mortar. Some of our soldiers said they could not be sure whether they were really seeing this or were dreaming. They weren't stupid, why would they just call it California? Also, the story may be more than just fable. The idea of griffins is not to be taken lightly. Quote, the griffin is seen on ancient metals, and the chariot of the sun was drawn by these imaginary animals with the head and wings of the eagle and the body and legs of a lion. They represented strength and activity. Basilius, 1647, says of the western coast of North America, quote, Chains of mountains stretch along the coast horrifying by their sharpness and steepness to their very peaks. Wonderful numbers of wild animals abound among their fastnesses. People tell that in the forest the griffies or griffins are found and that this is not fable but truth. Along the coast is a land of California. Nicholas Calafias paints Florida full of winged serpents. He affirms he saw one there and that the old natives were very careful to get its head. What if the events in the history of New America are really in the 1700s? I know, crazy right? Well, you really think most of these cities were created the way they say they were? It doesn't make sense that the settlers found this new land and paved the way with hard work and labor, and somehow found the time to build the railroads that went across great mountains. The Disney Golden Dream says that it's from Chinese labor. Yeah, right. Also, the bald people from earlier? Yeah, looks familiar to something else, doesn't it? Remember that for later. But anyways, the Phoenicians had many establishments all around America in Mexico, California, it's not just them, the Moors, or the ancient Lemurians, the Turks, they all knew about America before Columbus as well. There's also many legends of a distinct race of giants with red hair. Physical evidence of giants throughout the Americas. The Windover Giants. In 1982, a bulldozer operator unearthed an underwater graveyard containing 168 full, 8 foot on average skeletons. 70 of the Wendover skulls contained brain matter in which DNA was taken and tested. Surprisingly, the DNA did not match up any of the surrounding American Indian tribes. Joseph Lorenz, a, gene a geneticist from Coriel Institute for Medical Research, too was seeking the DNA markers that distinguished Native Americans inside the DNA samples taken from the bones of the Wendover mummies. Once he compared the DNA to present European peoples, he stated the following, I went back to the screen, and I looked at the sequences again, the first person's DNA, it looked European. When I looked at the second one, it also looked European. When I looked at the third, fourth, and fifth, it was slightly different from the first two, but they looked European. It is assumed by some academics that this was some kind of mass murder, as the necks of the bodies were all broken and faced north. However, upon further examination, it was concluded that this was done po post-mortem. Not only that, but it was discovered that many of the children were found to be holding small toys in their arms. One body of an elderly woman was discovered to have broken and healed many bones throughout her lifetime, implying that this society had the resources to care for her into her old age. Though it's claimed to be the site of a mass murder, none of the bodies show signs of having died any violent deaths. Lovelock Cave An example of actual living giants from our modern era is the Lovelock Cave account in which a tribe of white giants were said to be living. The rumor goes that the Paiuti and Shoshone tribes spent many years battling this tribe of reddish-haired giants until finally conquering the last of the numbers in Lovelock Cave. The Paiuti and Shoshone placed some burning bush at the entrance of the cave and allegedly suffocated the last of them. It is said that the surrounding European settlements disregarded the events as pure fancy. 
That is until several years later when a mining team collected, collecting bat guano discovered not only storage pits in the cave, but tool hunting decoys, oversized shoes, and giant human skulls and bones. There were a whopping 20,000 artifacts discovered at Lovelock Cave. The idea that this could have been a hoax is more ridiculous than the idea that these artifacts were created by giants. In many states, we have these strange massive hills, sometimes called Indian Mounds. In the 19th century, many people reported digging into these mounds and unearthing giant skeletons ranging 7 to 10 feet in height. In the mid to late 1800s, many reputable sources reported on these findings, including the New York Times. It's likely that common knowledge was much different during this period. Despite the fact that Native Americans nearly all have giants in their history, we are still told in school that things like this are fantasy. This intentionally paints the Native Americans as mindless savages who could not differentiate between fantasy and reality. Nowadays, these mounds are now protected sites and are said to be very sacred to the Native American cultures that allegedly built them. When questioned about these matters, Organizations like Nat Geo and the Smithsonian Institution divert the conversation from giants into giantism. This is a shallow attempt at covering up what cannot be unseen. Giantism in humans is statistically very low, about 0.000007%. So in order for them to explain all the giant bodies that they found, they would have had to have dug up 2.5 million bodies in order to have come across that many deformed skeletons. If those points don't catch your interest, then consider the fact that we have this quote from Abraham Lincoln that states, The eyes of that species of extinct giants whose bones fill the mountains of America have gazed on Niagara, as ours do now. What do we see when we look over the writings that were left down to us? When you see coat of arms, this is symbolism left for the initiates. We see these symbols all over the books of New America, but tell me this, why do they not teach these books in schools? It's one of the first books on America, shouldn't we see how incorrect they were? Well, these symbols are Phoenician symbols, and you'll see them all over architecture. In the Tartari community on YouTube, the idea is that the Phoenicians are these controllers that basically took over everything and rewrote history. That may be the case, but the idea is that they didn't build the architecture, the Tartarians built it, and the Phoenicians kind of cleaned it up and added their own symbols. But I see these symbols more of a cause of the Venetians, not the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians is one of the great races that established colonies all around the world. In the Bible there references the great builders of the Temple of Solomon, where again, in the Venetian engravings, you will see their symbols all over the buildings. The Venetians are the one most likely taking over ancient Aryan architectures and making it their own. Quick summary on how this could be so. To understand the evil that is Venice, we must look at the great poet's portrayal of the unbelievable duplicity that Venice represented. Works by Marlowe and the Jew of Malta, and by Shakespeare in The Merchant of Venice, and especially in Othello, The Moor of Venice. This is by no means an attack on any group of people, we're just looking at history and coming to certain conclusions. Please don't take anything I say as truth. Do your own research. Venice worked with the Turks to create a republic of usury and slavery. Contarini is a key figure for Venice in its war against humanity. Contarini was trained at Padua University, the son of one of the oldest families in Venice. Every Venetian oligarchy family sent their children to Padua University to become trained Aristotelians. To understand Venice, you need to understand that Aristotle is pure evil. Aristotle is almost unreadable, so what made his work so influential on Western civilization? Aristotle is a thoroughgoing defense of oligarchical society. In his politics, Aristotle is most explicit. His theory of the purpose of politics is to maintain inequality. The very basis for Aristotle politics is the maintenance of the master-slave relationship because it is, as he asserts, natural. Quote, that one should command and another obey is both necessary and expedient. Indeed, some things are so divided right from birth, some to rule, some to be ruled. It is clear then that by nature some are free, others are slaves, and that for these it is both just and expedient that they should serve as slaves. I'm not saying anyone did anything, there's nothing offensive about this. We can look at these events in history and just study the writings of some of these key figures. It becomes very clear what their intentions are. These quotes are not taken out of context either. It is true that even Plato makes a case for slavery, but unlike Aristotle, Plato bases his state on the idea of justice. Just compare Aristotle's politics with Plato's Republic, 
where Plato from the very beginning launches a diatribe against arbitrary power. I contend that the reason that Aristotle was so widely influential in Venice is that Venice was a slave society based on the principle of oligarchism. In another video I will have to completely break down what's going on here, but basically this ideology spread into England through Paolo Sarpi. This phase can be understood as the fight between Giovanni, young houses, and Vecchi, old houses. In this phase, a very radical faction took over. Paolo Sarpi was normally a Servite monk who was exceptionally talented, yet he was much more. He was the leading organizer of the Giovanni. Out of the Giovanni salons and secret society, Venice planned the destruction of Christianity and what was later to be called Freemasonry. Any book about Sarpi, a modern historian by the name of Wooten proves that Sarpi was the creator of empiricism and taught Francis Bacon his so-called scientific method. This work proves that Sarpi revealed himself in his work to be a radical atheist. Think about how influential Francis Bacon was on Christianity, being one of the editors if not the main editor of the King James Bible. This also starts to make very clear why we are taught a specific cosmology in schools. Sarpi is the real founder of modernism and the enlightenment. With these ideas, he created Freemasonry, which dominates England to this day. Out of this ordeal came Giordano Bruno, Galileo, the Rosicrucian cult, and the Thirty Years' War. The Giovanni very consciously had to build up their own faction among the English nobility. English had to be totally controlled. The way the Giovanni functioned was by the creation of a protestant-controlled merchant class. This was most explicit with the creation of the Venice Company by the Earl of Leicester, the founder of the Puritan movement in England. It was he who was granted by certain trading routes. In 1581, another trading company was created with a Venetian agreement, called the Turkey Company. These two companies later merged and became the Levant Company, which later became the infamous British East India Company. These symbols are the elite telling you a secret and a different story. These books on the history of the New World are filled with these symbols. What's going on here? You can also see that these symbols are much older and that they've been used for quite some time. This is history being rewritten. For you still see Phoenician architecture in major cities all around the world. From Cadiz to Venice in California. Why would settlers travel to America to be free and start building European type architecture? It doesn't make sense. It was already there. And not too long ago, 200 to 300 years ago, there was a great reset and there has most likely been more than one. The great expositions of the world are all put up by the same establishment in order to keep this continuous lie. How many cities were destroyed in fire? Why put all this effort into building an exposition with all this ornate detail and it does look like stone and then go through the effort of tearing it all down in such a short span of time? Some of these buildings from San Francisco look much older and the truth is they are. They look very antediluvian and there's a reason why. Because these buildings were before the flood, which is actually not too long ago. What does that mean? It means we have completely lost touch with reality. A thousand years of time has been added to our calendar. Think about it. There is a thousand years of literature, music, and art that are completely missing. The art that we know from the Renaissance is another Venetian scam in which artists were made up for all these great Aryan masterpieces. If you really look into it, there is no text that is before the 1500s. If it is, it's most likely made up. These writings from Benzoni are probably not from the 1500s. Type in any classical musician. You'll see a big gap in the history right before the 1700s. Same for literature. And sure, don't get me wrong, there are examples for different writings from different eras, but most of the time, they don't have a clue when it's from. History as we know is not what we think, and I'm not the only one stating this. I didn't come up with this. One great reference is Fomenko. As many have mentioned, he is an extremely intelligent man known for his feats in mathematics. One of his key works is the New Chronology where he goes over how our mainstream history comes from one man known as Scaliger. There are some familiar scientists who disagreed with the chronology of Scaliger Petavius and reckon that the real ancient and medieval chronology differed significantly. De Arcija, 16th century. It is known merely that De Arcija claimed an ancient history to have been forged in the Middle Ages. However, we regrettably failed to have found any of his works. The Salamanca University could not give us any information about them either. Sir Isaac Newton. The great English scientist, physicist, and mathematician devoted a large part of his life to chronology and published a large volume entitled The Chronology of Ancient Kingdoms Amended, to which is prefixed a short chronicle from the first memory of things in Europe to the conquest of Persia by Alexander the Great. Jean Ardouin. 
eminent French scientist and author of a large number of works on philology, theology, history, archaeology, and numismatics. He was also director of the French Royal Library and wrote a few chronological works with sharp criticisms of the entire edifice of the Scaligarian chronology. He was of the opinion that the most of the so-called ancient artifacts were either counterfeit or belonged to a much more recent age. Robert Baldoff, the German philologist of the late 19th and early 20th century, assistant professor at the Basel University and author of the four volumes entitled History and Criticisms. He came to the conclusion that the ancient literary works were a lot more recent than one has accustomed to think. Guided by philological considerations, Baldoff proved that those works were all medieval in their origins. Edwin Johnson, English historian of the 19th century, criticized the Scaligarian chronology severely in his works, claiming that they needed to be truncated drastically. Wilhelm Keimer, late 19th century, a German scientist and lawyer, developed a method of verifying the authenticity of ancient documents. He discovered nearly all the ancient and early medieval Western European documents to have been either copied or forged in a more recent age. He came to the conclusion that both ancient and medieval history was falsified, and wrote several books on the topic. Quote, the chronology of ancient and medieval history in its present form had been created and for the most part concluded in a series of fundamental works of the 16th to 17th century that begins with the writings of Josephus Justus Scaliger, 1540-1609, called The Founder of Modern Chronology as a Science by the Modern Chronologist E. Bickerman. The ground-laying works of Scaliger and Betavius of the 16th to 17th century present the ancient chronology as a table of dates given without any reasons whatsoever. It is declared to have been based on ecclesiastical tradition. This is hardly surprising since history has remained predominantly ecclesial for centuries and for the most part was written by the clergy. Today it is believed that the foundations of chronology were laid by Eusebius Pamphilus and St. Hieronymus, allegedly in the 5th century AD. On figure 1-6 we have a medieval painting of Eusebius Pamphilus of Caesarea dated 1455. It is worth noting that Eusebius of Caesarea is painted in typically medieval attire of the Renaissance epoch, most probably because he had lived in that period of time and not any earlier. Despite the fact that Scaligarian history ascribes Eusebius to the 4th century AD during the years 260-340, to 340, it is interesting to note that his famous work titled The History of Time from the Genesis to the Nicene Council, the so-called Chronicle, as well as the Tractate by St. Hieronymus Jerome weren't discovered until very late in the Middle Ages. Apart from that, historians say that the Greek original of Eusebius is only available in fragmentary forms nowadays, and it is complemented by the Ad Libdium translation made by St. Hieronymus. It is very significant that the Scaligarian chronology was initially created with the paradigm of the Western European Catholic Church, which had remained in its firm control for a great amount of time. Many eminent Western European chronologists of the 16th and 17th century have belonged to the clergy. Scaliger, for instance, was a theologian. Titian Adorf, the founding father of paleography, was a doctor of divinity. Dionysius Petavius, a Jesuit and an author of several theological writings. This whole idea that the Greeks and Romans are the civilizers of society is a complete lie. He says that the events in the Bible are far more recent than you can imagine. The Old Testament is actually more recent than the New Testament, ironically. The events in the Old Testament are actually from less than 500 years ago, according to Fomenko. The new chronology offered by Sir Isaac is a lot shorter than the consensual chronology of Scaliger. Newton moved most of the events stated as preceding the Epoch of Alexander the Great forward in time, closer to us. His revision isn't as radical as that contained in the writings of N.A. Morozov, who was of the opinion that the Scaligarian version of ancient chronology was only voracious starting in the 4th century AD. Let us mark that Newton did not go further in time than the BC AD mark in his research. The first researcher of our time who had raised the issue of providing scientific basis for the consensual chronology in its fullness and quite radically was Nikolai Alexandrovich Morozov. In 1907, N.A. Morozov published a book titled Revelations in Storm and Tempest, where he analyzed the dating of the New Testament apocalypse and came to the conclusion that contradicted the Scaligarian chronology. In 1914, he published The Prophets which contained a radical revision of the Scaligarian datings of the biblical prophecies. In 1924-1932, N.A. Morozov published a fundamental work, Christ, in seven volumes. The initial name of this opus had been The History of Human Culture from the Natural Scientific Point of View. 
It contains detailed criticisms of the Scaligarian chronology. The important fact discovered by Morozov was that the consensual Scaligarian chronology is based on an unverified concept. Having analyzed a great body of material, Annie Morozov put forth and partially proved the fundamental hypothesis that Scaliger's chronology had been expanded arbitrarily as compared to reality. This hypothesis was based on the tile repetitions that N.A. Morozov had found, namely tile texts that apparently describe the same events, but are dated differently and considered unrelated in our time. The publication of this work caused vivid discussions in the press, and its repercussions can be found in contemporary literature. There had been a number of rational counter-arguments, but the critical part of Christ remained indisputable in its entirety. N.A. Morozov did not go further than that of the 6th century AD in time, considering the consensual version of the chronology of the 6th to 13th century to be basically correct. We shall yet see that this opinion of his turned out to have been gravely erroneous. Quote, Before the 13th and 14th century, the devices for time measurement were a rarity and a luxury. Even the scientists didn't always possess them. The Englishman Valcherius was lamenting the lack of a clock that afflicted the precision of his observations of a lunar eclipse in 1091. Quote, the clocks common for medieval Europe were sundials, hourglasses, and water clocks, or clipsidrae. However, sundials only were of use when the weather was good, and the clipsidrae remained a scarcity. In the end of the 9th century AD, candles were widely used for timekeeping. Modern historians base their observations of the Scaligarian chronology believing that medieval authors had attained a state of great confusion in what concerned both concepts and epochs due to their alleged ignorance, and that they had confused the ancient biblical epoch with the medieval one. Medieval painters, for instance, kept portraying the biblical and the ancient characters in typically medieval costumes. However, another point is viable, one that differs from the traditional love for anachronisms explanation. Namely, that all the statements made by the medieval chronographers and artists may have reflected reality, and we consider them to be anachronistic because we follow the erroneous Scaligarian chronology. The oldest, more or less complete copies of the Greek Bible are the manuscripts of Alexandria, Vatican, and Mount Sinai. All three manuscripts are dated as the second half of the 4th century AD. The Codex language is Greek. The least is known about the Vatican Codex. Nobody knows how the artifact manifested in the Vatican around 1475. The Alexandrian Codex is known to have been given to the English King Charles I by the Patriarch Cyril Lucarus. So, the three oldest codices of the Bible only surface after the 15th century AD. What we know for certain is that the history of these documents can be traced as far back as 1475 AD. In other words, no other, more or less complete, ancient Greek Bibles exist. There are no Hebraic manuscripts of the Bible predating the 9th century AD in existence, although those of more recent time, primarily the middle of the alleged 13th century AD, are kept in many national libraries. The oldest Hebraic manuscript is a fragment of the Books of Prophets, and is dated to 859 AD. One of the two second oldest manuscripts is dated to 916 AD and contains the Books of the Prophet, the other is dated to 1008 AD and contains the text of the Old Testament. The Scaligarian history insists that all the events concerning the Biblical Patriarchs occurred precisely and exclusively on the territory of the modern Mesopotamia in Syria. Nevertheless, it is immediately acknowledged that as to what concerns the identity of the Patriarchs Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, one can just reiterate that the information obtained as a result of the most fruitful excavations in Syria and Mesopotamia was extremely meager or simply non-existent. Furthermore, the Scaligarian history is of the opinion that all of the events involving the biblical Abraham and Moses occurred on the territory of modern Egypt. It is evasively stated that, quote, the historical intensity of this tradition is not confirmed archaeologically, but its historical plausibility is, together with an account of the circumstances that may have been setting the patriarch's biography. Archaeology as well as the historical sciences in general can find no proof to the biblical legend about the Egyptian slavery of the Jews. The Egyptologist Wilhelm Spielberg tells us that what the Bible tells us about the plight of Israel in Egypt isn't any more of a historical fact than the accounts of the Egyptian history related by Herodotus. Archaeological research shows that the books of the Old Testament have no archaeological proof of their localization and dating as suggested by the Scaligarian tradition. Thus, the entire Mesopotamian biblical theory becomes questionable. Fomenko's work is very dense and it would take me an entire series to cover, however, just know that there is much more to this than just mere fancies. 
Yet with the Vatican holding 50 miles worth of archived documents, it makes you wonder what they could be. The rational skeptic will say they're just boring people records. Duh, yes, I'm sure there's some people records, but 50 miles worth? That would imply that human history has gone on far longer than we've been told. Here's the thing, I know many already in the rabbit hole will understand this information, but I want to make it more widespread. It really comes down to an understanding that there might have been a cataclysm in the past, and that maybe it had some type of intelligence. Maybe, just maybe, this could be controlled by certain individuals. I'm not pointing fingers, but I'm just saying that there's a group of people that probably are not who you think they are. That's all I'm going to say. But let's continue. We all know the Bible stories of the Flood. There's also the Greek myths of the stories of Niobe and Pharonius, but these myths are all around the world. There is a cataclysm of water and of fire, and there will be many more, says Solon. It's not a crazy idea. Basically, a group of individuals survived the cataclysm and took their chance to conquer the terrestrial paradise, or the ancient legends of California, which are probably not so ancient. After the Great Cataclysm, the Spanish returned once again to the land, now being ruled by an outside nation, which, only having older documents, were not yet sure what was going on. They went to explore the Great Terra Firma, but they find bald, white cannibals with great strength and great stature. Also, the females are in rule like in the stories. What if before the reset, the occupants possessed advanced technology, and after the reset, this led to EMFs pervading the land? You can tell that they were well aware that they were balding, and that this is not just artist error because in another book, they are cutting off the other tribe's scalps and wearing their hair as hats. Also, to show the connection between the Phoenicians, this ritual of pouring gold into the mouth in this manner is exactly the same thing as shown in this old book on the destruction of the Tower of Solomon, again, establishing the connection. But back to what I was saying about technologies. A lot of these ancient buildings in America that we know and call historic buildings have these different types of energy devices on their tops. Also, the Founding Fathers had to wear wigs. This is never fully explained in the schools and it makes me wonder if it has anything to do with these white cannibals. Again, people refuse, but the Founding Fathers are most likely not what we think. I mean, come on, Benjamin Franklin discovered electricity by tying a key to a kite? The stories they tell us. And what about Mount Rushmore? It was just sculpted from dynamite? Maybe so, but what if these inhabitants were here before the cataclysm? Then something intense happened, and everything was destroyed. Perhaps before the cataclysm, their hair began to fall out because of the technology being used. Electricity and photography are likely much older than we are led to believe. They had ways of transferring electricity without wires, and this led to a buildup of EMFs causing sickness in people. Are these the same people from the Bry engravings, but either some great cataclysm? The knights are wearing metal helmets, and I think these would do little to protect from bullets or swords. Was it to protect their hair? They obviously knew that these individuals looked quite sick. What this is is a cover-up history document that is taught to Freemasons as we can all see the symbolism throughout the book. The Mormons did not create the temples that they possessed, they simply found them and dug them out of the mud. Do you know why we don't build in brick anymore? Some people don't realize the complexity of building with stone, and that's the real reason why we don't do it. It's far too much work for these small groups of cylinders to have accomplished, and Take into consideration that they're telling you in the Book of Mormon that the Phoenicians came to America. As I was researching this, it became clear that some of this Latin is very difficult to translate, and English translations are very hard to come by. I also thought to myself that Latin seems honestly kind of backwards, and it doesn't really add up when you think about it. How could it be a dead language when the Gaelic languages are still alive in some form? I also thought it was very strange that these books are written in Latin and then translated from there. They say Pig Latin has no connection to Latin, but I'm not so sure. Pig Latin is a game played by children to mix up words, and it's also used in programming. But it comes from an even older term known as Dog Latin, where the priest would actually create new words with Latin, or even rearrange the sentence. I know that certain words are derived from Latin, but when you put it all together, it doesn't seem like a language that was actually spoken. It seems like some type of code to make you think that all the different languages actually originated from Latin. Hence, Greek, again giving credit to show that the Romans and the Greeks are the civilizers of society. There's a significant amount of evidence to show that many English and Hebrew words are derived from Gaelic. 
It is said that the Hebrew priest, after the Phoenicians, rearranged the Hebrew alphabet. And in order to keep the power of the language of the Chaldeans away from ordinary man, the numbers were also rearranged, so that the old language that was based on divine symbolism had been corrupted for the masses to use. If this is so, then we can begin to understand how big the lies really are. I don't intend you to accept this as truth, but maybe, just maybe, you will start to question what you really know to be true. Let go of everything you think to be true. Relax the mind and ask the question, do I truly understand what this reality is? 